Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, what is up, Summit? So, we're saw, dude, as like teenagers like to say. And for people from my generation, that really confuses us because when we saw people, they were all dudes. So that was super confusing for people like me. But if you haven't met me or if you don't know me, I'm the youth pastor here at Summit, and it's a privilege. And y'all know it's going to be a good Sunday when the youth pastor gets up here to preach. And... <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even a holiday, and I'm super pumped about it. So, anyway, so some of y'all, um, I don't know about y'all, but I have had one of those weeks. I've had, oh boy, oh boy, kind of week. Anybody ever had those kind of weeks before? Because let me tell you, I have had that week. You know, it's kind of like butter and toast. So, with butter and toast, when you get some toast and you put some butter on it, you don't want all the butter clumped. Like, that may be how it comes, but that's not how it's going to end up. When you get butter and toast, you want that butter nice and smooth all the way across the surface if you know what I'm talking about. Like, you want that toast to be even with butter, but that's not how life works. Life works where the butter comes in one big serving, and I'm talking about all the problems. Like, it just comes in one big serving in one week. But don't you wish you could just spread it out across, you know, your life? Like, if God just would spread it out, but no, it all comes in one week. Well, that was my week this week. So... Anyways, I've been honestly looking for someone to complain to all week long, and uh, I just realized that I get to preach on Sunday, and y'all just so happen to be a captive audience. So would y'all mind if I complain to you? Go ahead. Well, good. Those of you who said no, too bad. I got the microphone, so... Here we go. So I've had one of those weeks. I've had one of those oh boy, oh boy kind of weeks. This week I wrote over 15,000 words in homework and sermon alone. That's a lot, by the way. And that's roughly 30 pages single spaced, if you didn't know. And so already off the bat, I'm complaining about all the writing that I have to do this week. And the truth is, I'm not even under exaggerating. Like, the truth is, I'm, I'm not over-exaggerating. Like, the truth is, I actually might be under-exaggerating. And if you want to hear somebody who over-exaggerates, well, Edward will be back in three weeks. And <laughs> you can ask him about the latest fish he caught. You know, <laughs> kind of hope he's not watching this. But <laughs> so here we are. So I think for the truth is, speaking of, you know, I'm kind of kidding about that, but at the same time, I'm also not including all the text messages I sent this week. And honestly, I send quite a bit of text messages. Actually, who am I kidding? I actually don't send text messages anymore. I look for the most obnoxious and crazy emojis and gifts that I can possibly find, and then I send them. And that's how I communicate to people nowadays. Now, some of you in the room are already asking, uh, what are you still doing in school? And the truth is, if I had to answer that honestly, I don't really honestly know uh, either. So for some of you in the room, you're still trying to figure out what are emojis and gifts. And you're probably over the 
age of 40, so I'd simply just tell you to ask your grandchildren, and they'll let you know what that is. So anyways, uh, I'm, I'm kind of digging a hole here, but I'm just telling you, I've had quite a week, and you would think that the 30 pages would be all that I had to complain about. Nope. At this point, folks, you might as well just simply buckle in, because I've got a whole list of complaints to lay on you this morning, and just pretend to at least kind of care a little bit, because I've had quite a week. Now, after having to prepare for all of this, the reason I had to write all this this week is because this week is finals week, and for me, so I had two eight-week classes that I had to complete, and then I had to prepare sermons so I could be here to speak to you wonderful individuals. And by the way, which honestly is the best part of my week. I'm like, you guys are wonderful, and you're wonderful individuals, so this honestly is the best part of my week. But on top of all of this, right after second service today, I've got a mission trip to go on, and so I've got all this stuff to plan for this week. Oh, real quick interruption. Inside, the inter in, inside my list of complaints, this week, God has finally answered one of my prayers. Like, big time prayer. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, fellas, dreams do come true, is what I'm saying right here. Like, this week, now I had to pay for it, but this week, I got a bass boat, and I was super pumped about it, man. Woo! I was excited. I cannot wait to get that thing out on the water. Oh, wait. That's the same bass boat where a battery blew up on my face on Tuesday. I'm not kidding. This is how my week started off. Hey, look at that picture right there. That's what happened. Has anyone ever had anything like that happen to them? Like, I've been, like look at that. Some of y'all, you've been working on batteries all your life, and that's never happened. Well, that just goes to show you my kind of luck. And so, I guess apparently you're not supposed to connect a wrench with to the positive and the negative circuit all at one time while you're holding on to it. Like if you do that, there's a possibility the battery might blow up in your face. And so when that happened, so I was I got this boat, I'm trying to clean off the circuits, and so I was gonna take off all the all the wires that were connected to it because they were really eroded. And when I was doing that, I was in there digging and I didn't I didn't realize and my wrench came over and made the connection and, and it went all through me, burned my finger turned my fingernail black and <laughs> knocked me on the ground sounded like a gunshot and so that's kind of what happened and then so then on top of all of this this happened on the only week that we actually lose an hour of sleep <laughs> and you would think that my list of complaints would end there nope <laughs> in addition to all of this guess what sermon I get picked to preach on like we're in a series, and this is the sermon I get picked to preach on. Death. Like, what an exhilarating subject to talk about. Let's pick the youngest guy on staff, and let's ask him to talk about death on a Sunday morning. Now, I don't want to dig a hole that I getting into here, but I'm just saying, I, I'm like, I'm the youngest guy on staff here. You know, Edward gets to talk about rated R subjects. Edward gets, you know, Jay gets to talk about grace and love and hope. And the youth pastor, he gets to talk about death. And I'm not sex or tattoos, which I talk about plenty of. I'm a youth pastor. No, we're going to talk about death. And so, anyways, if I can be honest with you, this is exactly how I felt when Jake Connor asked me to talk about this subject. I was honestly not that excited about it. And now don't get me wrong, guys. I love an opportunity to get up and teach and preach. I feel like it's what God has gifted me at. So don't get me wrong. Like anytime I'm given the opportunity to present the gospel or share it, I'll take it. Because I want to do it because I feel like that's what God's called me to do. And I don't want to waste that. But this is not exactly what I had in mind. However, as I began to study the concept of Jesus' death this week, my disclination began to dissipate little by little. And suddenly I found myself being reminded of beautiful old truths that I once fell, first fell in love with. The fact that Jesus' blood was what redeemed me in the beginning. Yes, the fact that his death was what the reason that I do what I do. And so as I began to study these things, I kind of started feeling bad about acting the way I was acting and my whole list of complaints and everything. So you see, the thing is, Jesus' death began 
with an extraordinary event in history. And apart from his resurrection, it is one of the most extraordinary events in history. And it would forever change humanity, and it would forever change mine and your relationship with the Father. And so, Jesus' death is by far extraordinary, pure, breathtaking event that happens throughout history. And I pause here. I pause here because what I'm talking about today, I want to handle it as gracefully and tenderly as possible. Because to talk about Jesus' death means to talk about our death. And to talk about our death means to talk about sin. Yes. And the truth is when we start talking about sin, sin's kind of ugly. And it's not exactly a fun topic to always talk about. So when we start talking about sin, I realize this, that no one is exempt from the struggles of sin. Everyone has to deal with sin. Whether you're a believer or even a non-believer, sin is something that is prevalent and it's something that until we leave this earth, we're going to have to deal with. That's right. From the elders in this church, to you, to me, to as righteous as Edward is, we all have to deal with sin. So because of this, I want to talk about a, little thing, a few things regarding death and sin. Number one, because the truth is, no one is exempt from sin. We all struggle from sin. And we know this to be true because of Romans 3.23. Sin literally means to miss the mark. So if you can imagine, I don't know if you grew up in a church like I did, but he would say, the old preacher would get up there and he'd say, it's kind of like an archer. Right? And he's pulling back and he's going to hit this very pure center, dead center of the bullseye. Now, if he gets off even a little, he's missed it. When we pulled back and when we shot our, and we, and we shot our bow, we were way off. Like we weren't anywhere near it. And if you, met, if you even got slightly close, you had to be dead center to be perfect. And you see, God put his standard for us as humans and humanity because of who he is of ultimate perfection. And because he has this standard of ultimate perfection, he expects, because of who he is, he expects everyone to reach the standard. Like, in order to be in relationship with him, in this, you would have to achieve the standard of ultimate perfection. So, sin literally means to miss the mark. It means we've sinned against God. You see, God has set that standard perfect for us, and I'm sure that you've heard the story of when it all went wrong. God created us in the, His image, perfect. Way back in Genesis chapter 3, however, we messed it all up. Now guys, I know where your mind's already going, so don't. It's not her fault. <laughs> Listen, I was back here with my teenage boys, my high school boys, and we were talking about identity. And that's the first thing that came out of one of those boys' mouth. Well, Eve is the one that went ahead. She started it. Like, no, that's not at all what, like, the truth is, you're just as much, actually, probably more responsible for what happened in the garden. Therefore, you also have inherited the sin. Why do I say that? Because God gave you responsibility. And you are, and, and when we look in the garden, Adam wasn't exactly necessarily resisting and saying, oh no, I don't think so. No, we see Adam embrace it. We see him embrace sin. He sees something that he wants his flesh desires and he takes. And therefore, we're just as guilty. And so we see in Romans 3.23 that no one is exempt for all fall short of the glory of God. And in fact, if we had to pick a primary scripture for, uh, for today, it would be Romans 6.23, where it says, for the wages of sin is death. Because to talk about death is to talk about sin. Because of our sin, we now have death. You see, after looking at Romans 6.23, I think we have to ask the question, what is death? You see, death is the process of dying and passing away out of this world as a result to our sin. 
that separated us from God. And therefore, this is something, and I, I want you to catch this, this is something that is unnatural. Like this is not how God intended our relationship with him to be. This thing of death is completely unnatural. And some, it's something that separates us from God eternally. So to die means to be separate from God, and to be separate from God means to be found in God's wrath. Now that's a big deal. And to be found in God's wrath means to be found in the lake of fire as seen throughout the scriptures. Look at these two verses. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 9. Now it says this, in Revelation 20, 15, it says, if anyone's name was not found and written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now I don't know about you, but if I pair these scriptures right here up to a verse in Matthew chapter 7, you could mess yourself up. Like you could mess your life up. Like it would, it would mess with you because I'm telling you right now, these are two of the most terrifying verses in the entire Bible. Like when we look at this, if anyone is not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into a lake of fire. I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up to be thrown into a lake of fire. Like I can't even hold my hand to a match very long long, let alone spend all of eternity burning up in a lake of fire. But this is the end result for our sin. And we look at this and the way they will suffer this punishment is eternal destruction away. Like this, destru this, this lake of fire, this isn't something that's going to happen temporarily. Like this is for all of eternity. And we see where we have fall, far we have fallen in humanity. And we see, however, you know, it's bad and it's terrifying as these two pieces of scripture are, and I, and I say this because if you pair it up with Matthew chapter 7, where there's a scripture in there that used to keep me up as a little kid at night. Like, I kid you not, like, it scared me to death. I, I grew up with, uh, the, when I first, when I was real young, there was this fire and brimstone preacher, and man, he'd get up there, and he'd start spitting, and he would start, you know, declaring, you know, but he would get up there, and he would say this verse in Matthew 7, and it was this, if many will come before me saying, Lord, Lord, See, this is engraved in my mind. <laughs> many will come before me saying, Lord, Lord, I confess in your name, prophesy in your name, do many mighty works in your name, cast out demons in your name. And he will look at them on that day and he will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. So if you pair this up with that, like that's terrifying. Because when, I, I don't know about you, I've never casted out demons. I, I, I haven't, maybe some of you have, but I have not. I've never, I've never done those great mighty works that he's talking about, like raising someone from the dead. I've never done that. And if those guys stand before God and they can't even get in, I don't stand a chance. And so when I look at that and then I look at that, I'm like, dude, I'm doomed. Like this is not looking good for me. So all those, these verses seem terrifying. There is a worse thing about these verses than eternal destruction that far exceeds the agony of the lake of fire and death. And that's simply this. It's what death was intended to do in the first place. The worst part about these verses is look down at the second verse where it says, eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. That's the worst part. Some of you are thinking, I don't know, Dave. The lake of fire and eternal agony sounds pretty bad to me. I'm just saying. No, track, track with me just a minute. You see, the most people fear, that's what most people fear the most. But yet they've not experienced the full glory of God yet. Because once you experience the full glory of God, his presence will become agony to be separated from. Let me put this into perspective. How many of you in here have ever been in love? If you were sitting by your wife, you better raise your hand, man. I'm just saying right now. I mean, so deeply crazy in love that when you were separated from that person, like your heart, it hurt. Like you, you, and all you could do is find yourself thinking about that person. And you were thinking about that person so much that I, I remember, I remember uh, my wife and I, we started dating in high school. And I get so excited, we call her, and woo, I was getting excited, you know, she's calling me. That made me so excited. And then when we weren't together, it honestly, sometimes if I started thinking about, man, it started hurting. It literally hurt because I loved and being, I loved being with her so much. 
It literally started hurting. Now imagine this. Spending an eternity away from the greatest, most purest, most righteous, most pure loving being in the entire universe after you've seen who he is. Then all you had to do for all of eternity is be alone and in the dark and think about who he is and suffer an eternal agony. You see, that's really what hell is. Hell is being separated from who God is. Hell is being, is the absence of who God is. Now I feel like we've, do, we've dove into some pretty weighty stuff. And if you don't mind, youth pastors got to take a break from that. So I want to tell you a story because that's, 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 everyone loves a good story. And uh, I want to take you down memory lane real quick. Back to about 2005, maybe 2006, 2004, somewhere in that, that era. There was this young, skinny, awkward kid, that's me, and he had big feet and an overzealous ego, let me tell you. He had it all figured out in life. In fact, y'all like to see a picture? Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me show you a picture. <laughs> Look, this kid had it figured out. Here's the thing about this kid, picture. You would mistake that for a 10-year-old. That kid was 12 or 13. You see, I was the shortest in my class apart from two other kids. And uh, this is why I'm saying, if there's anyone young in this room who's still, look, eat your green, be eat your green beans, you're going to get up, you're gonna, it's, it's going to work out for you, it's going to be all right. Or I think it might have been Mountain Dew, I'm not sure. Uh, you don't know what they put in there, I'm just saying. But that young kid, let me tell you, he had it all figured out. He was going to be, get this, you are looking at the next all-star NBA star right there. That's it. That right there was the next Michael Jordan, and you're looking at him. So he had his life mapped out. He knew exactly what he was, exactly was going to do in life. I'm going to tell you the story picks up right here, and the story picks up. So my brother and I, we were basketball aholics. We loved basketball. There was nothing greater in the world and, or in our life than basketball. Let me tell you, when we got up and we were getting ready for the bus, we played basketball while we were waiting on the bus to come. As soon as we got to school, we had about 30 minutes, 20 minutes when we got to school because we lived way out in the country, so our bus was always one of the first ones in. We went to the gym and we played basketball. As soon as school was over, my mom taught. As soon as school was over, we played basketball, not to mention the practice we had during the day. Like, we were playing basketball literally five Five to six times a day for several hours a piece during that day. Like we loved basketball. And during that time we were on every team that we could possibly be on. We even played during the summer. We played on different teams during the summer and all kinds of stuff. Well one summer we were playing on like this, this, this team that was down at the youth center and they get different guys in the community to be various coaches. Well my dad became the coach of my brother's team. And I was, and I was cool because my dad was not my coach. I'm just saying. And so I had this real cool 20-something year old who was coaching our team. And let me tell you, we wiped up the competition that year. Like there was nobody who could stand a toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I think we won the whole thing. Like there was no, we never lost a game. At least that's how I remember it. But we rem I remember winning every single game. And I'm pretty sure that I made a lot of the points. Uh, <laughs> But my brother's team, on the other hand, he's two years younger than me, and my brother's taller than me. He's 6'3". He's a little bit taller than me. My brother's team was not doing so hot that year. And so there was always this rival between me and my brother, who was better, me or him. And even in school, everyone would debate, who's really better? Do you think Dave or do you think Shane's better? Who do you think's better? Well, I don't know if Dave was Shane's age. You know, I don't know if Shane was Dave's age. You know, it's hard to tell. So there was always this rivalry. And so when my brother's team wasn't doing very good that summer, let me tell you, it made for some good brother bonding time in the car on the way home. <laughs> and I let him have it. Now... Where the story gets good is because this kid had an overzealous ego, he would always help his dad out with his younger brother's practices. And so every week, dad would come and pick me up, and we'd go, and I would help my, my dad run some of the practices. Well, one week, I made one of the most bullheaded, jerk statements that you could possibly make. And honestly, look, I, like, I know that kid looks innocent and sweet, but he was a terror. And I'm telling you right now that that kid was lost.
Because what's about to come out of that young kid's mouth, like I still feel bad about it. Like it still breaks my heart. And I know that I was a kid. I know I was, I was, I was lost and I didn't understand. But at the same time, I'm still like, I still think about it. But what came out of that kid's mouth, and I made sure that all my brother, my brother could hear and all his friends could hear. So I had a captive audience. This is when I put my foot in my mouth usually. So be careful today. But as soon as all my brother's friends around, I said this. I said, you guys are so bad that if you could even win one game, I'd give every one of you 50 bucks. That's what I said. One of the jerkiest things I could have possibly said. You know what? That came from a place of pride and that came from a place of sin. Because that's how, as people, we've inherited this sin. And so I said that statement. And when I said that statement, guess who heard? Daddy heard it. <laughs> you know, at that point in my life, I knew I had stepped in it, if you know what I mean. But I wasn't really willing to admit it yet. And so, I, uh, my dad, as soon as I got the car, lectured me. He said, now boy, you don't ever make a statement you can't back up. And he lectured me and told me that wasn't a good thing for me to say. But he said, don't you ever make a statement you can't back up. He said, now if they win a game, and my dad, let me tell you something, he was deadly serious. If they win a game, you will pay each one of those boys out of your own account 50 bucks a piece. And this is not a small team, by the way. This isn't like a team of three or five. You know, like this is a full team. He said, you will pay every one of those boys 50 bucks. And... I don't know, like I knew he meant it. And he said, if you can't pay it, you'll spend the entire summer working it off and then going back and paying those boys. Like you will have no summer, no friends, no hanging out. And I can tell you right now, I believed him. But honestly, I didn't care because I didn't think they were going to win a game. I thought I was going to get away with it. Well, as you can probably already guess, because it's a story, my brother's team found a new motivation. <laughs> and... Overnight, suddenly they became all-stars. If you're coaching a peewee team or a summer league this year, let me tell you something. You offer those boys 50 bucks a piece, they will be rock stars. I'm telling you. Because the next game, they started, I'm telling you, slam dunk it. I'm just kidding. They didn't do that. But that, uh, they were killing it. And they beat the other team. And then they continued to beat teams after that. But it was that one game that set fear into my heart. Because I realized that now I owed a debt that I could not pay. And I would 100% be expected to pay it. And my dad would hold me accountable. And my dad has never not held through on his punishments. And as a kid, I thought he enjoyed it a little bit. I'm just saying. <laughs> now looking back, I realized he was just being a good dad. So my dad, after the practice, or after the game, he said, now you've got a week he said, next week at practice, you better have all that money for these boys. So my dad comes and he picks me up. I'm 12 years old. Where am I going to get the money at? But I'm scared. I believe him. So he comes and he picks me up. And we go to practice and we're sitting in the car. And this is where the story changes. Now remember, my dad is not someone who's not going to hold their own his word. But this is where this story changes. And this is where I learned one of the most valuable lessons in my life. That I will ever learn. Let your yeses be yes and let your noes be no. And don't ever say anything that you shouldn't be willing to back up. Because my dad said, if you don't have that 50 bucks, you go in there and you will tell those boys yourself that you can't pay them. So we show up and we pull in and we're sitting out in front of the gym. And my dad's picked me up. It's just me and my dad in the car. My brother, I guess my mom had dropped him off or something. For some reason, it was just me and my dad. And we're sitting in the car and my dad looks over and he says, you got the money? So I know doomsday has come. I'm ready for it. I'm getting ready for this punishment. He's probably going to bust my butt. And so he looks over and I, and I, say, I say, no, I don't got the money. I mean, I got nothing else to say. I'm, I got nothing. And I'll never forget this because it literally broke. Like, I, I, looking back on this, I, I, like, there has been times where I've shared this story and I've cried. Because this broke my heart. My dad reaches inside of his pocket. And he pulls out an envelope. Inside of it, he's got fresh $50 bills. And he hands it to me. 
No strings attached. Doesn't punish me. He simply gives it to me and said, now, for, now on, be good for your word. What my dad did in that moment is what we call a million dollar word in theology. I'll never, re I didn't realize it at the time what he was teaching me, but I do now. He taught me a million dollar word and that million dollar word is called propitiation. My dad paid a debt that I could not pay. And so what the word propitiation literally means is it's an act of appeasing a debt that a debtor owes. It's stepping in and taking on what someone else deserved to take on. I deserve to pay those kids back whether I had to work my butt off the rest of the summer. Because I made a statement that I should have been able to back up. But my dad steps in where, my, where I had sinned and steps in and pays it for me. I don't think it was in my dad's plan to give everyone on his team $50 a piece. I don't think that was on his plan. Like, he could have done a lot of things with that other than that. When he did that, man, that, looking back on it, that kind of messes me up. Because this is not, Jesus' death became that substitute for what I deserved. Jesus literally became my propitiation. Like, this is what Jesus did to a much more enormous amount now, this is not to say that God's wrath is necessarily diminished. Because sometimes I feel like in Christian culture, we think, oh, because he's punishing his son, he's going to hold back a little bit. I mean, that's his only son, right? He's not going to absolutely obliterate his only son. But you have to understand, when we depict God's wrath, he inflicts his entire wrath on Jesus on that cross, he doesn't hold back. He pays the debt in full. And that means that every bit of fury that you're deserved, Jesus takes on. And so I share this to simply say that Jesus is the propitiation. But God is just as good and holy and just in his wrath as he is in his forgiveness. So as a result, God is perfect in both his wrath and his forgiveness. So when Jesus went on that cross, he became separated from God. And we already talked about what the worst part of hell was, right? It was literally to be separated from God. I mean, like, that's the worst part. And that's what Jesus does. Now imagine somebody who spent his entire, like, lifetime, his eternity with God, and then is suddenly going to be separated from him. He's been in the presence of this all pure, loving God all his life. He knows the presence of God. And then all of a sudden, so you think it's going to be bad for you. Imagine how bad this is for the son, the only son of God, when God is about to separate himself. That's right. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 34. It says, Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloli, Eloli, lama sabahathini, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I don't know about you, but that scripture is horrendous. Like, why have you abandoned me? Like, that's the worst part. Like, I don't think Jesus wanted to be separated from the Father. But we think about this, that's exactly what God literally turns his back on his only son and infuriates the wrath of what you deserved on Jesus when he dies on that cross. And that's a really big deal. And when I realize that, my sin becomes a whole lot more serious. Because this is not something that Jesus wanted to do. Look at the Garden of Gethsemane if you don't believe me. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. He says, he went on a little further. Now, this is before Jesus is about to be crucified. He says, he went on a little bit further, and he bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done and not mine. Like, Jesus is saying, don't do my will, do yours. But God, if there's any way, I don't want to do this. Like this is not, so, and I feel like we get this idea in our head that Jesus is going to the cross, he's going and he's courageous, he's performing this heroic act, and yes, it may be heroic what he does and courageous, but that's not the primary point. Like Jesus is not, this is not on Jesus's I want a to-do list or his bucket list. I mean, let's call it for what it is. It's a crucifixion. And when we hear the word crucifixion, let me put it in Western terms for you. It's a slaughter. And Jesus is about to get slaughtered by his own people. For your sake and my sake. 
And so Jesus' flesh did not desire to be apart from God and be martyred. Jesus was crucified as a result of God's mercy and grace for humanity because he wanted to do the will of the Father, not because he desired to become a martyr. I think in Christian, I, I think... This is why when we read it, we see that Jesus, and we, see, we read verses like he is tender and he's love and grace. Look at this scripture in Ephesians 1, 7. It says this, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with blood of his son. You think? Yeah, he's rich in mercy and grace. Like, I can't even imagine looking at, like, I don't have a son, but I can't even imagine looking at him and, and begging me, please don't let me get slaughtered. Please don't let, like, if there's anything I can do, please don't let, like, anything else. And I can't imagine looking at him and saying, nope, this is my will. Like, that would, like, I'm telling y'all, if I was God, you guys would be in trouble. I'm just saying. And so when I look at this verse, it kind of messes me up. So, yeah, he's rich in grace. Yeah, he's rich in mercy. I mean, that's an amazing verse. Therefore, as Christians who have accepted the sacrifice that Jesus has made for me, I personally think that taking my sin should be a little bit more serious when I'm talking about my sin. So, I think that should be a high priority in our lives when we notice what Jesus actually paid to forgive us. That's right. And so, although I might, here's the thing, when Jesus forgave me, he forgave me of my addictions. Now, this is where it gets good, and we're taking a, another turn. We've, like, we've been doing some weight stuff, but this is where it gets good. And this is where, I mean, it's, this is good stuff. He forgave me of my addictions. He forgave me of my dishonesty. He forgave me of my lust. He forgave me of my greed, my covetousness, my slandering, my putting others down, which I did. I'm guilty of. By the time I was 12, I was putting others down, right? And my pride, my selfishness. And he forgave me because I, necess I did not share when I was supposed to share. Jesus forgives me of those things. And I don't know about you, but that's a huge weight that was lifted off my shoulder. When my dad gave me that money, I didn't have to go, that money, I didn't have to go and be embarrassed in front of all of my brother's friends. Like that was a huge weight that was lifted off my shoulders. Jesus coming in and being that propitiation. That makes me excited, church. Like that gets me going. And then suddenly realizing that I'm no longer held responsible for all of these sins, that gives me joy. And joy is something that cannot be taken away. And that's real good stuff. So that kind of grace, that kind of grace is worth praising. That kind of grace is worth shouting about, and that is worth telling somebody about. And so I'm going to do something. I'm going to talk about several verses of forgiveness throughout Scripture. And let me tell you, these verses are worth saying amen at the end of. So what I want to hear, maybe you've never done it, and you're like, what did I walk into? I'm telling you right now, these are worth saying amen at the end of. And I want you to say amen at the end of these verses, because these are good verses. And let's, uh, hey, don't give me the I'm too cool card, because the teenagers give that to me all the stinking time. And I've seen some of y'all at football games. Y'all get wound up. And if you can get wound up at a football game, let me tell you, there's much more reason to get wound up here in the house of God because this place, this is awesome. So when we look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, re start reading with me. It says, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Now that's a big deal and that's worth an amen. Now Hebrews 8 chapter 12 says, for I will be merciful towards the iniquities and I will remain remember their sins no more. That's what I'm talking about. Psalms 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west. And that's enormous. Like you can't get further away than that. So far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's a huge deal. That's awesome. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14, he delivered us from the dominion of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for forgiveness of sins. And that's, that's awesome. And you can't get that in no football game, by the way. That's the best thing in the world. First John chapter 2 verse 2 says, he is a propitiation there's that million dollar word for our sins and not for ours but only for also the sins of the entire world. Romans 8 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation in those who love Jesus Christ and in Christ Jesus. Romans 10 9 says this and I love this verse. I use it all the time when I'm, when I'm talking to people and I'm leading them in this, I'm leading them to the Lord so there is therefore no uh, Romans 10 9, because
because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Amen. And then the most famous one of them all. John 3, 16. And maybe in a Western culture, you've become inoculated this verse, but I'm telling you, don't be this morning. Because this is an incredible verse. Yes, it is. This verse is amazing. Look, look at it with me. For God so loved the world, a world that he didn't have to love. And that's not in there. I added that. <laughs> and he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Amen. Man, that verse, you probably grew up hearing it, yes. but that's a big deal. And so as a Christian, when I look at stuff like this, you see Jesus' death dissipated, eradicated, exterminated, obliterated, separated, annihilated, and even massacred my sin completely. It removed what I did wrong. And because Jesus' sin completely obliterated and massacred my sin, I want to illuminate his name. And what I mean by that is the scripture that's found in Matthew chapter 5. And as a result of what Jesus has done, I want to declare his name in the most boldest ways possible. I'll never forget about growing up in rural Arkansas. I mean, it's where my roots are. If you didn't know, I'm a hillbilly, and I'm a hillbilly down to the bone. I may put on a pretty face here on Sunday morning, but if you get to know me, I'm a hillbilly. And I'll never forget, we had this big old red barn, and it was out far away from the house. And in order to go to that barn, you would, you know, you'd kind of just venture out in the dark. And once you got to the barn, you'd open the door, you'd turn on this big, and the lights, we had big lights in that barn, and they would just turn on, and I'd feed the horses, and I'd feed the cows, and I'd feed the pigs. And, but when I got done feeding, I'd walk outside of that barn, I'll never forget the sound that barn door makes. I don't know if you have memories like that from your childhood, but I do. And I would walk out that door, and it was a little single door on the side. I'd walk out that door, and it had hinges on it and a spring. And when I walked out, it would squeak, and, go, and then I'd walk out, and it would slam behind me and hit that barn door. But when I walked out of that door, you could not see the hands in front of your face. It was so pitch black dark. And I'm sure you guys living around here in rural Texas can relate with what I'm saying. When there is no moon out and you're out in the middle of the woods, it is pitch black out there. You can't see anything. But there was always one thing I could count on. It didn't matter how far I was down in the field. If I could see my house, I was good to go. Because my house always had a light on the back porch or either on the front porch. And so I would start walking towards the house. I couldn't see what was at my feet, but I knew if I kept in the right direction, I just kept walking towards the light, I was going to be all right. You know, and that's kind of what God's called us to do as Christians. Mm -hmm. He's called us to be that light of the world. Yes, he has. And this is as a result to his death. Yes. And so when I look at this, I want to illuminate the darkness. But in order to illuminate the darkness... I have to not look like the darkness. And so when we respond to Jesus' death, we illuminate the darkness. As Christians, when we treat our sin with seriousness, and that's a big one, we illuminate the darkness. As Christians, when we love others the way that Christ loved us, we illuminate the darkness. And here's one of the big ones too. When we forgive others the way that Christ forgave us, us, because we didn't deserve it, we illuminate the darkness. You see, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill, and it cannot be hidden. Nor do people put a lamp and put it under a basket, but they stand and it gives light to the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to the Father. When we become a light of the world, we set an example for others, leading them out of the darkness and we are just like that porch light that was in my life as a kid. And we lead others back to home the way they should go. And so, no matter how bad your week's going, no matter if a battery exploded in front of your face, or you had a fight with your spouse this week, this week wasn't going the way that you expected it to go, 
You've, you had a schedule that was busier than you could possibly imagine. Your kids grew little devil horns over the week. No matter how bad your week has been, you can know this as a Christian. You stand on a rock and Jesus died and became the propitiation for your sin. And that's worth celebrating about and nothing is going to take that away from you. That's right, amen. So as a Christian, no matter how bad your week has been, there's something worth celebrating. And it's because of this reason, and I want to, I want to, because I feel like I've talked a lot about hell, and I've talked a lot about death, and I've talked a lot about how we should respond, but I want to speak in this sense too. When Jesus died on the cross and he became the substitute, he offered an invitation. And that invitation was an invitation he gave to everyone sitting in this room. And that invitation was an invitation to accept him as the Lord of the world, of the universe, mm -hmm. and of your own life. Right. I love one of my old missionary friends, and I love the way he put it. And I know this is such a simple way to put it, but I love the way he put it. And honestly, I can't think of any better way to put it. You've probably heard this before, but imagine everyone in this room is the ruler of their own life. You're sitting on a throne and you delegate the decisions. You make the decisions. You say where you're going to go. You plan your ambitions. You plan your dream, which is exactly what the American dream is, right? You make the decisions. You make your own fate. Now imagine getting up off of that throne. This is how he explains it all over the world. He says, now imagine getting up off of that throne, stepping off that throne, stepping down, and giving Jesus that throne. That's what you do when you surrender in the Romans 10, 9. When I ask students that are struggling, like, I don't, I don't know where my relation stands with Jesus. And I say, well, have you ever had a Romans 10, 9 moment? I'm not trying to make this, I'm not trying to make this super uh, step by step. But what I'm saying is, have you ever had a moment where you abandoned your sins, believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and made a relationship with Jesus, confessed him as your Lord, and asked for forgiveness of your sins? Have you ever done that? Because that is the moment in which there is some point in your life that you probably had a moment where your life changed forever. And that's when you accepted who Jesus Christ was on that cross. And so today what I want to do is, that's the reason we celebrate the blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the band to go ahead and come on back up. And we're getting ready to dismiss. And when we dismiss, what we're going to do is we're going to celebrate the blood of Jesus Christ. And about every corner in this room... There's communion. And every week here at Summit, if you're new, we take communion. We ask that you take communion with your family or your brothers and your sisters in Christ. But when we take communion, we do such in a manner that we are celebrating what Jesus did on that cross. That blood, it was through his blood that we were made clean. And so when we take communion, I feel like, you know, when you do it every week, well, sometimes we might forget why we do what we do. That this is something that's special that we get to do. I mean, this is one of the few things that we get to do to celebrate back what Jesus did for us on that cross and say thank you and give glory to him. And so today we're going to take communion. But before I do, because there's a place in scripture that talks about taking communion with an unclean heart. When Jesus died on the cross, we ought to take our sins seriously. And we probably shouldn't take communion when we're not in right standing with God. That's right. And so... I want to encourage you, and I say encourage because I want to encourage you, if you're struggling with maybe a sin in your life, or you know you need forgiveness, or maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's a place back here called Grace Place. And I would encourage you during this time, don't go take communion. I want you to go back to Grace Place. Someone wants to pray over you. Don't do this. Don't, don't, this is too good not to share with the world. When I tell students, you may make a decision, and it may be a decision you make sitting in your seat right now, or when you're at home alone, but this is not a decision you keep a secret. And so, if you're struggling with one of those things, maybe you're a Christian and you're struggling with sin. Maybe you're not a Christian and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to be that propitiation for your sins. If that's you, I want to encourage you to go back to Grace Place. I'm going to pray and we're going to dismiss into communion. Y'all pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for letting us come here today, that your spirit might dwell here in this place. God, thank you for becoming that substitute and paying that debt that we could have never paid. Making us right before God that for no longer I've been crucified, I've now been crucified in you and it's no longer I who live Christ, but now it's you who lives within me. And so God, we just give you praise and we give you glory for that. Thank you for everything that you've done. And Lord, that we might give us boldness that we might go out throughout this week and share that with every individual that we encounter. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.